Hey, everyone, and welcome to WDIM News, my weekly podcast where I talk about sci-fi stuff and some other stuff. My name is Eric. Thank you for joining me once again. And if this is your first time here, well, welcome, and I hope you enjoy yourself. This week, like most weeks, I'll be starting off with my review of the most recent episode of Star Trek, that being the eighth episode of the second season of Strange New Worlds, titled Under the Cloak of War. But besides talking about Star Trek, I have a lot of other stuff to talk about in the world of sci-fi. First, I want to discuss a new film titled The Creator, which recently released an epic trailer ahead of its release later this year. It looks really cool, and I think fans of movies like District 9 and Blade Runner will like it. And then, I want to give an update on the actors and writers strike going on in the United States right now, and how the studio seem to be handling the work stoppage. Spoiler alert, it's evil as hell. Next, I want to talk about a bit of what could be good news, which is that Donald Glover is now writing a series based on the character Lando Calrissian from the Star Wars franchise, a character he played in the film Solo. Then I want to talk about something very sci-fi that happened in the real world last week, and that would be the UFO hearings that I'm sure you have heard a lot about, but may not understand what was and what was not shown during these things. And then I will end by discussing the recent MCU series Secret Invasion, which I had very high hopes for since it is a story seeped in science fiction, but boy, were those dashed pretty quickly. I also thought it would be fun to look at all nine MCU series that have been released and rank them in terms of my own enjoyment. In case you have not seen them and are thinking about watching any, or maybe you have your own opinion on which is best. But before I get into all this, I want to thank you for clicking on this video and ask that you please hit the like button right now to help the algorithm and get my little sci-fi podcast out to more people. Also, don't forget to subscribe because I do release many other videos throughout the week. All right, so first let's talk about the most recent episode of Star Trek Strange New Worlds titled Under the Cloak of War. I did release an Easter egg video right after the episode was released. So if you want to check that out, you can after you watch this podcast. I really like this episode. Uh, Every week, I seem to bring up that Strange New Worlds can do a different type of episode every week, week in and week out. And once again, they prove that they can do a very dark episode. This is definitely the darkest that Star Trek has felt since Deep Space Nine. You know, with this episode dealing with the moral ambiguities of war and combat in a way that you don't often see on Star Trek, especially in the early years. I know that when Gene Ronberry created Star Trek, he wanted to seem like a utopia that didn't include things like this. But then in later iterations of Star Trek, especially Deep Space Nine, in a real world, if there is a utopia, something had to be built that isn't so perfect to make this perfect world. And I think that Deep Space Nine, more so than any other series, really showed that in a great way, not just with the Dominion War, but also with the Cardassian occupation of Bajor. And it showed that sometimes there are no good guys and bad guys. Sometimes there's a lot of gray in between the black and white. And this episode really accentuated that once again. And I loved it because Deep Space Nine is my favorite Star Trek. And the fact that Strange New Worlds can go so light the week before with the crossover episode and then go so dark here. And then next week again, they're going with the musical episode, which is going to be super light, I'm sure. It's really a testament to how great this series is and how... Every week, you know, week in and week out, you can expect something different. I also thought that this episode created more of an emotional connection with the audience using the backdrop of the Klingon War than the entire first season of Star Trek Discovery was able to. I talked about this a little bit in my Easter egg video, but Star Trek Discovery really delved into the Klingon War. I know there was a period when the USS Discovery popped into the Mirror Universe, and then they had to pop back to the Klingon War. That was the most we've ever seen of the Klingon War and kind of the damage that was done there. And in that year, it seems like it was almost as destructive for the Federation as the Dominion War was, which I believe was two years. So that took twice as long to do just as much damage, which is pretty much a testament to to how crazy that war was with the Klingons, because the Dominion was this huge force of uh, alien species. But the Klingons were just themselves. I don't think that they were aligned with the Gorn or anybody else during the Federation Klingon War. So that's crazy that the Klingons were able to cause that much damage. And you see that in this episode. You see how crazy this war is. You know, whereas Discovery made the Klingon War just feel like a bunch of big battles in space where these ships get destroyed. And it's almost like G.I. Joe. Like, you don't even know, like, who these ships are for the most part. And in this episode, I mean, it establishes all these characters that very quickly we care about, especially the one that Dr. Mbenga you know, heals, and then he has to go right back out into the field. And of course, uh, he perishes on the mission. It's really good storytelling. I mean, it made me feel like I was in an episode of MASH. It really showed that Star Trek can do wartime stories. And I thought that this episode did a way better job of depicting 
how crazy the Klingon War was than Star Trek Discovery did. And again, Star Trek Discovery had a whole season to do it for the most part. And this was just one episode of Strange New Worlds. I thought that this was also a fantastic performance by Babs Osunmokum, who once again has shown that he is a very, very interesting, dynamic character. In the first season, we saw him be kind of sneaky, but it was to save his daughter from a disease. And then in this season, we learned that not only is he a little bit sneaky, but he also like is able to take this drug that turns him into a super soldier. And then in this episode, we learned that not only has he taken it before, but he actually designed the drug and that maybe he was a soldier before he was a doctor or something like that because the Andorian officer says that he has the most hand-to-hand kills. I don't think you would get that if you were just a doctor, you know, even during war. So maybe he served uh, in the infantry or something. I don't even know. But it's pretty crazy that we have this character that is so dynamic and he was just you know basically a background character on the original series only appeared in a few episodes and now strange new worlds and the actor who plays dr omega have made him so much more dynamic and it made me think kind of you know especially at the the way this episode ends that right now he's the chief medical officer on the enterprise but dr omega is not the chief medical officer on the enterprise when kirk takes over i wonder if this is why i wonder if his kind of feelings about the Klingon war and his propensity towards violence at times eventually gives Captain Pike pause, or maybe he tells James Kirk, you know, maybe you want to bring on your own chief medical officer when you take over the ship, because while Dr. Mbenga is great, he's got this dark side to him too, that you may not want with your chief medical officer. I mean, prime directive of a doctor is the Hippocratic Oath, which is that they should do no harm. And Dr. Mbenga certainly does not seem to have a problem with causing harm when he has to. I mean, obviously, at one point in the episode, we see him try to be recruited towards a mission and he turns it down because he wants to be a doctor. But eventually he feels like he has no choice and he has to you know, join the fray, so to speak. I also loved how the ending was left up to the viewer's understanding and the events weren't really shown. They were like kind of shown behind a pane of glass. And we're also left wondering, you know, was Nurse Chapel covering for the doctor? They made this really strong bond. You know, we see not only them in the war, but this is the first time they met. They met in this, you know, mash tent triage station that was just insane. And of course, when you go through something insane with somebody, it creates a special bond that you can't really break. And I think that that's what's occurred between Nurse Chapel and Dr. Mbenga. And they're really there for each other. And I think she would lie for him. When the doctor is talking to Captain Pike at the end of the episode, he's kind of saying like, you know, maybe it didn't happen like that. What if it happened like this? What would you think? You know, do some people deserve to die? And, and I also like that because I think that at the end of the episode, it's kind of like, Captain Pike is the embodiment of Gene Roddenberry's Star Trek. There's a way to get out of everything. I mean, this is even a guy that knows that he's going to die, you know, saving people's lives. I'm talking about Captain Pike, of course. And he's trying to be like the the perfect Starfleet officer, you know, and he's trying to present that point of view. And then you have Dr. Mbenga, who's kind of the gray, more realistic kind of side of things. And that's more the Deep Space Nine, I think, side of Star Trek that's a little bit more realistic and sometimes purist Star Trek fans are adverse to it. So I thought that that was really cool. I thought that it was almost like both sides of the argument, you know, the Gene Ronberry argument, quote unquote, were embodied in these two characters at the end of the episode. I thought it was just great. I mean, it was another great way that I think Strange New Worlds proves that it is for the fans. It's not just to get great ratings and it's not just a bunch of writers coming together to make some episodes. There is a lot of care that goes into these storylines and these characters and the character development, because there was a lot of character development in this episode. We saw, you know, I haven't even talked about Artegas really, but there was a lot from her as well. And obviously she has some scars from the Klingon war and in the episode before Boimler specifically called her out as a war hero. So she, there's obviously a storyline that we don't even know that happened with her that I'm guessing that we're going to hear perhaps in the third or fourth season. And I'm really looking forward to it because so far they've just nailed it. And I really like the way they did this episode. I thought it was another great episode of Strange New Worlds. This is so far my favorite season of a Star Trek series. You know, unfortunately, we've got the writers and actors strike right now. So that may be, you know, hurting Strange New Worlds a little bit because 
none of the actors can do promotion for it now. And that's really a shame because I'm sure a lot of people would like to interview these actors about these really great episodes, but hopefully it doesn't hurt them too bad. And the show keeps, you know, getting more popular and more popular every week, like it seems to be doing. So let's uh, just briefly go over the plot line of the episode and some other points that I found. The episode begins with the Enterprise transporting a Klingon onto the ship that they will be escorting to a negotiation. The Klingon was not only in the Federation Klingon War, but was also a general that was thought to be responsible for a very bloody conflict that ended with him killing his own officers and defecting to Starfleet. I thought that this really was a great setup for the ending because it shows that war will never look the same to the people who are in it, to the people who read about it. And it's really easy to sit back, and I think they make this point in the episode as well, when you're one of the people that the people who are fighting in the war are fighting for, you have the ability to just sit back and you know say, well, they should do this and they shouldn't do this. This isn't right. But when you're in the thick of it, when you can't even hear yourself think because there are bombs going off and stuff, you're not going to think as rationally as you know as you would if you were in another state. Now, I'm not casting aspersions towards either train of thought. I'm just saying that you have to recognize that those two things are true. And I think that this episode, it sets that up. You know, we get this heroic story, or I guess not really heroic if he had to kill his own men anyway, but it's better than what we find out at the end when, of course, he didn't even kill his own men. He let his men die so he could get away. But it is kind of like not great to hear that Starfleet is using this guy. And even if he is just the butcher of Jagal, it's still pretty bad that they got him on the payroll, right? I mean, like, it's still not great that they have him as a negotiator. And of course, Captain Pike makes the point that to have somebody from the other side be a voice of reason for you is very powerful. And I get that point of view as well. But I also think it's kind of getting your hands a little dirty. There are a lot of uh, parentless children because of the actions during that war and during that specific conflict. And he's responsible for much, if not all of that. So I don't know how you get to wipe your hands of that. I mentioned in my Easter egg video, there's a really good episode of Voyager named Jatrell that has to do with sort of a similar character. Neelix, who is on Voyager, is face to face with this guy named Jatrell who created this weapon that killed a lot of Talaxians during a conflict. And there's a, you know, a good give and take between those two characters because Jatrell is trying to make amends for what he's done and he feels bad about it. But Neelix is like, it doesn't really matter that you feel bad about it. All this stuff still happened. Whatever you do, you can't really make up for, you know, what has happened already. And I think that that's a valid point. I think that it's good to hear those kind of stories in a sci-fi setting because th those are very relatable. Those are stories that happen every day around the world. And, you know, it's difficult to, to look at that. So back to what is going on in this episode, Dr. Mbenga, Nurse Chapel, and Lieutenant Ortegas, and others on the ship who have served in the Klingon War do not trust the Klingon on board and have a hard time hiding this fact. Captain Pike is determined to make this work for the good of Starfleet and invites everyone to dinner. And of course, that invoked memories of the Klingon Federation dinner scene on the Enterprise A in the film The Undiscovered Country. But Dr. Mbenga and Nurse Chapel are compelled to leave early, and Ortegas cannot help herself for expressing her feelings. I really like this scene too because it showed that not all Starfleet officers are perfect and it makes them more relatable. I get the Gene Roddenberry utopia side of things. Thinking that everybody's perfect and that everybody's going to do the right thing all the time, those characters aren't relatable. There's a reason that Batman is more relatable than Superman because Batman does the wrong thing sometimes. Batman gets hurt. Batman falls. Batman loses people. You know, and I think that those characters are better characters and they're easier to watch and they're ones that you care about more because they have little aspects of you in it. Like I've never served in any kind of armed forces, but I can still relate to these characters just because of people I know or family members and what have you. So adding all that to this sci-fi story, I thought was really great. And we're not beat over the head with it every week. We've had little hints that the doctor and Nurse Chapel and Lieutenant Ortegas have served in the Klingon War, but they didn't have to tell us every week just to get to this point, and it still makes as much sense. And I think that next week's episode, of course, is the musical episode, which will kind of break the ice for everything that was created in this episode. 
But even after that, I think we can still look at these characters maybe under a different lens, but I don't think it makes Ortegas less likable. I don't think it makes the Doctor or Nurse Chapel less likable because we know all this about them and what happened in this episode. Throughout the episode, though, we also see how Dr. Mbenga and Nurse Chapel first met, which I talked about before, which was during a battle in the Klingon War. They try and help various patients during the battle, and the Doctor even turns down a chance to be part of an attack team, but ultimately pretty much everyone else dies but them. Uh, I did think that it was a nice cameo from Clint Howard, because this is a pretty bleak episode, but when Nurse Chapel lands on the moon, and then you see Clint Howard, I immediately smiled, like, and I was like ha- almost sweating before that because everything was so tense. Not just with what's going on on the moon, but also what's going on on the ship. And then Clint Howard shows up and it's Baylock, you know, <laughs> I just like, I, I like that. That was really smart. I don't know if that was on purpose or what, but it was really smart to use Clint Howard like that and to see him once again uh, in Star Trek. And during these scenes, we also learned that the doctor created the super serum that he and Nurse Chapel took earlier in the season. I thought that was pretty crazy. I really want to learn more about Dr. Mbenga's past because I think it makes it seem like he was a soldier before he was a doctor. And then he kind of combined those two talents to make this super serum, which is really interesting. So I really would like to know more about Dr. Mbenga. And I wouldn't mind just like a short trek that has to do with his past. Soon we learn in the episode that the Klingon is lying about his escape. And it was actually Mbenga who infiltrated his compound and had killed his men. Instead of taking part in the battle, he fled to the Federation. This was a really good stinger because you kind of felt the whole episode that something was off with this guy, the the Klingon, I think his name is Ra. But to have it play out like this, that it was actually Dr. Mbenga who killed those guys and the Klingon was just like, peace, I'm out. Like, I don't want to die because, of the, you know, the, my guys are getting killed by this human. I thought that was a really smart way to kind of link these characters. And I think it is kind of convenient storytelling to have the Klingon uh, eventually end up on Dr. Mbenga's ship. But having said that, I still think it's a good story and it gives Dr. Mbenga some closure. But it then, you know, it opens up some more truth about him to the captain and perhaps to some of the rest of the crew and definitely to the audience, which the doctor probably did not want to share. The doctor then reveals to the Klingon that he knows the truth about him and threatens to expose it. And a fight ensues in which the doctor kills him. Again, this was left up to the audience's interpretation how this went down. But the fact that Mbenga brought the Klingon dagger with him, I mean, that's pretty damning. Like he didn't bring it to the, you know, he didn't bring it for show and tell. I think he definitely had a plan with it. And maybe he was like not 100% before he did it, but he was at least 60-40 to be able to will himself to bring the dagger to the, you know, to their meeting or whatever in sickbay and then do what he did. And I think that this really makes the Doctor a very mysterious character, not Garrick level mysterious, but almost, you know, to that level where you don't really know where he's coming from. You don't know if this just is a Doctor who's going to save everybody not you know now what if we have a situation where they find some klingons that need to be saved like they're trying to save their lives is the doctor going to try his best to save them you know is he just going to kill every klingon he sees because of his past trauma we don't know that and i think that's pretty cool i think it's cool that we don't know everything about every character because that leads to more character development and pike really just wants to make himself feel better like I feel like Pike kind of knows what happened and he just wants to hear from the doctor that it isn't what he thinks happened. And that's not what happens at all. Pike kind of gets his worst nightmares confirmed and learns that the doctor probably killed this guy in cold blood. Really, a really interesting episode. I loved it as a fan of Deep Space Nine. I just I love this episode. I thought it was a great episode and a very, very needed entry into Star Trek. Sometimes Star Trek portrays things as too perfect. And I like it when, you know, they show that it can get pretty messy. But let me know, what did you think of this episode? Did you think it was a good entry in the franchise? Or did you think that this was another, you know, non-Gene Ronberry kind of story that doesn't really line up with what the theme of Star Trek is supposed to embody? Let me know what you think of this episode in the comments below. So now let's talk about some stuff that is not Star Trek. First, I want to talk about a movie that's coming up soon, and it's called The Creator. 
Now, this has nothing to do with religion, or it may have religious undertones. I don't know, but uh, I know that, like, when I say, like, hey, have you heard this movie, The Creator? They're like, oh, is it another one of those movies? No, it is not another one of those movies. This is a straight up science fiction movie, and it is described as an action thriller directed by Gareth Edwards. Uh, if you're not familiar with Gareth Edwards, he did the 2014 Godzilla film, and he also did Rogue One, which was kind of like the sequel to Andor. And the film stars John David Washington, who is the son of Denzel Washington, as well as Gemma Khan, who was just in The Eternals, and Ken Watanabe, who's been in a lot of stuff. And it follows a plot of an ex-Special Forces agent who is recruited to hunt down and kill the creator who developed a mysterious weapon with the power to end a war between the human race and the forces of artificial intelligence and mankind itself. And this film, which is set to be released in the United States on September 29th in 2023, it does look like a post-apocalyptic movie where AI has come to life and it's amidst a future war between the human race and the forces of artificial intelligence. Joshua, a hardened ex-Special Forces agent grieving the disappearance of his wife, is recruited to hunt down and kill the creator, the elusive architect of advanced AI who has developed a mysterious weapon with the power to end the war and mankind itself. Joshua and his team of elite operatives journey across enemy lines into the dark heart of AI-occupied territory, only to discover the world-ending weapon he's been instructed to destroy is an AI in the form of a young child. The trailer itself looked really cool to me. It really reminds me of a Neil Blomkamp film like District 9 or Chappie or Elysium. The robots kind of just look like, you know, the robots from those movies. And just the action looks really epic and crazy. And it looks like I said, like there are robots that also have humans, but also robots that look like they are human. And the kid that the main character is there to destroy is one of those like human looking robots. John David Washington, besides being the son of Denzel Washington, also was in the film Tenant, which was another, you know, sci-fi film that I didn't really love, but I don't think it had anything to do with his performance. That movie was just too crazy. Like I still, I don't even know if I understand what Tenant was about. I think it was about time travel or maybe, I don't know, I don't know, but it was nuts. So hopefully, uh, you know, this movie, The Creator, is not that crazy and it's a little bit easier to follow, but it does, like I said, feel like a District 9 style movie and I really like that. I like that like near future kind of dystopia where humankind has, of course, screwed up and whatever we did is coming back to destroy us. And in this case, it's AI and AI is a very hot button topic right now, especially with the writer strike and the actor strike, but not just that, just in the general workforce, there's a lot of concerns about AI. And it looks like this is another story where, you know, kind of maybe like the Matrix, where AI has taken over and, and humanity is fighting for their survival. So I think this is going to be a really good movie. I'll put a link to the trailer in the uh, description below if you want to check it out. But uh, let me know after you watch the trailer, what do you think of this? Do you think it's going to be a cool movie? Do you think it's just going to be another, you know, sci fi? AI tries to kill us Terminator style movie or do you think that this movie is going to be kind of new and has something to say I think it does I think that Gareth Edwards is a really good director I like what he's done I like the movie Rogue One a lot more than I like Andor I liked Godzilla uh, 2014 both movies did have a lot of emotion to him so I expect that from this movie as well and I like kind of the dad daughter or story that seems to be very popular right now, like kind of like The Last of Us and and those kind of stories where you have like an older man protecting a young girl. And I think that that's kind of what this movie is as well. So whatever that genre is called, I like that genre. And I think that this is going to be a good film. But let me know, what do you think of the creator and will you be going to see it? So speaking of AI, let's go into the real world now. Maybe this is a little scarier than talking about a movie, but um, I wanted to give you an update on the strike with the writers and actors, and it isn't great. So there was a story recently in The Hollywood Reporter. They basically looked at a bunch of job boards and found that every studio is hiring specialists that have to do with AI development. Now, why is this bad? This is bad. Because right now there is a strike going on and the writers and actors are saying they don't want AI to be a part of the creative process. And it looks like the studios are rebuffing that and are saying, we don't really care what you want. We're going to hire all these people and we're going to do what we want to do because we're big studios. That is just some evil stuff right there. I mean, there's also stories that are coming out where like 
The studios are not even at the negotiating table right now. They're just waiting out the writers and they're waiting out the actors to starve them out so they have to come back and agree to their terms. It's just really bad stuff. The CEO of Disney, Bob Iger, makes seventy two or seventy eight thousand dollars a day. That is just insane. I mean, you know, like and he's not even part of the creative process. He's not an actor, he's not a writer, he's not even a producer. He doesn't even, you know, draw and you know, he's not even drawing storyboards or doing the catering. Like he has nothing to do with making any of these things and he's making more money than anybody else. So it's pretty crazy. I know there's a lot of uh, good impassioned speeches out there. Brian Cranston, Danny Trejo did one, uh, Jamie Lee Curtis, and I know Anthony Rapp from Star Trek Discovery did one. And I really feel bad for writers and actors. And I hope that whatever happens, I hope they get what they deserve because really they're just asking for living wage. Like it doesn't seem like they're asking for anything that crazy. And the studios just do not want to hear it at all. So the optics on this are not great for the Hollywood studios. It really looks like, you know, the actors and writers are in the right here. So back to the story from the Hollywood Reporter. It looks like the studios are quietly going on a hiring spree for AI specialist jobs. Netflix is hiring $900,000 a year AI product managers. Disney is looking for generative AI specialists. And Sony seeks an AI ethics expert while the tech becomes a staple of SAG, AFTRA, and Writers Guild picket signs. While the writer and actor strikes are driven by multiple concerns, questions about compensation being a one, there's no question that the role of artificial intelligence in entertainment has emerged as a hot-button issue. So they go on to talk about the speech that Brian Cranston gave in Times Square about Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney. It says that the actors fear the studios will take their likeness or voices and reuse them over and over for little or no pay. And we've already heard some confirmation of that, that there was a proposal on the table that you would be able to scan a background actor once and then use their likeness in perpetuity. Like they could put them in the background of anything, anywhere, and would not give them compensation for it, which is just insane. The writers fear that studios will use large language models like chat GPT to write or rewrite scripts, harming their livelihoods. The producers argue that AI use should be a balanced approach based on careful use, not prohibition, which sounds shady to me. And I looked into this a little bit, like if AI can write a script. And I guess that the technology right now is to a point where AI can't just create a script out of nothing. Like you have to feed it bits of information. And usually what they do is they'll say, like, write a new episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer based on all the scripts that have already been created or something like that. And the AI will be able to write a Buffy script based on, you know, characters or themes or whatever that it found in other Buffy scripts from before. And apparently they suck. <laughs> like this, the scripts that they write suck. And, and what a lot of people think will happen is that they're going to come to a point where they're going to have AI write just tons of scripts and then have writers do quote unquote rewrites on the scripts and then not pay them as much because they're saying, well, you didn't think up this script, so this isn't your script. You're just doing a rewrite on a script that we created with AI and basically making it so we can turn it into a series or a movie. And that's kind of where the technology is going in the short term. Long term, I'm sure they would love an AI that could just create like Oscar winning scripts and not have to pay it at all. And I'm sure that, you know, the actors and writers want to keep that from happening as well. While the future of AI in Hollywood is unclear, there's no question that the major studios and streaming services are intrigued by the technology. Job listings at almost every major entertainment company show that there is a veritable AI hiring spree going on as companies seek to understand how the technology can change their business. And again, I just think this is so bad because that is one of the main points of the strike right now that writers and actors don't want companies to be able to use AI like this. And these production companies are just like giving them the middle finger and saying, we're hiring people making more and more money than you're asking for. Like I said, these are jobs that are like 90 to $900,000 a year, and they won't pay actors and writers what they're asking for. It just sounds crazy to me. But here's a, a couple of examples of jobs that are out there in case you want to you want to you want to sign up for one uh, one job for Disney for an R&D imager focused on generative AI is looking for someone who has the ambition to push the limits of what AI tools can create and understand the difference between the voice of data 
and the voice of designer, writer, or artist. The role will collaborate with third-party studios, universities, organizations, and developers to evaluate, adopt, and integrate the latest generative AI. The job promises a base salary of up to $180,000 per year with the possibility of bonuses or other compensation as well. That sounds like a pretty good job, but it sounds like a job that is designed to take something, just a little piece from a writer or artist and make a movie or make a series or just use it in perpetuity. And that's what I think they're trying to do. They're trying to get more for their buck. Whatever they get out of a writer or an actor, they're trying to get more out of it than they do right now or pay less for it. Along with Disney, Amazon and Apple, of course, have dozens and dozens of AI jobs open, but some of those jobs appear specifically geared to their media businesses like an Amazon job for a senior project manager for Prime Video. That job is listed as wanting to define the next big thing and localizing content, enhancing content, or making it accessible using state-of-the-art generative AI and computer vision tech. The listing promises a base salary of up to $300,000. So again, another big salary for a job designed to take work out of the hands of writers and actors. I just really cringe when I read this story, and I really debated not sharing it with you guys because it's such a bummer, but I think that you deserve to know what's really going on out there and that there's two sides to this story, but it does seem like the good side is very firmly on you know the, the actors and writers, and these production companies really seem pretty evil to me. But let me know, what do you think of the writer strike? Maybe you have a different opinion. Maybe you work you know, in this industry and have a different perspective that I don't have. I would love to hear it because from my perspective, it just looks like you know Scrooge McDuck versus, versus just the, the normal guy. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's really sad. And, and I do listen to a lot of you know, the, the impassioned speeches that actors and writers have made while they're on the picket line. And these people aren't acting when they're saying you know, they're fighting for their livelihoods. They're fighting just to do the thing that they want to do, and I really feel for them. So I hope that this turns around quickly and that it goes in the actors' and writers' favor. But again, let me know. Do you have a different opinion or do you agree with me? I would love to hear your opinion in the comments below. Now, we do have a writer strike going on right now, like I've mentioned a few times, but it doesn't seem to stop Donald Glover from creating a new series for Disney+. Plus. Now, This is a little complicated, so let me get through it, and I'll discuss how it's affected by the writer strike. This story comes from the magazine Variety, and it states that both brothers, Donald and Stephen Glover, have signed on to write Lucasfilm's Lando series for Disney+. Now, the fact that they signed on is one thing, but because of the writer strike, it means they can't write anything. They may be writing stuff together. I mean, these guys are brothers, so they could be talking about stuff, and they could have you know something plotted out in their heads. But they're not going to turn anything into Disney Plus until at least the writer strike is over and maybe a little bit after. Because you don't want to just like flood production companies with scripts when the writer strike is over because that kind of gives them an advantage as well. So they might, you know, just start officially writing the series when the strike is over, but they have signed on the dotted line to do that. The first news broke of a Lando Calrissian limited series being in the works in December of 2020. At the time, Dear White People creator Justin Simeon was attached to the project, though it would seem he's no longer attached as Variety has been told that the Glover brothers will be writing the series alone. And as I stated, the deal was reached prior to the writer's strike. The character was originally played by Billy D. Williams in The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi. Donald first stepped into the role in Ron Howard's 2018 Star Wars prequel movie Solo, which also showed the younger version of Han Solo, played by Alden Ehrenreich. I don't know if they're going to bring him back. I think that would be interesting. And maybe if he's not the main character, because I know that his version of Han Solo was not that well received by the fans, but that movie had a bunch of problems too, I think. And I think everyone would agree that Donald Glover as Lando was the best part of that film. So it's cool that they're continuing on with that character. And it would be nice maybe to see Han Solo pop up for an episode or two. I mean, they did that with Hayden Christensen and uh, Anakin Skywalker, and they could do that with Han Solo as well. Uh, They asked Donald Glover about this, and he said, I would love to play Lando again. It's a fun time being him. It has to be the right way to do it. Time is precious. The past couple years, this pandemic, it really had people experience time. People realize their time is valuable. You only get so much. I'm not interested in doing anything that's going to waste any of my time or just be a paycheck. I'd much rather spend time with people that I enjoy. 
It just has to be the right thing. And I think it could be. Lando is definitely somebody I'd like to hang out with again. So I think that's really cool. I love it when actors care about the characters they're playing and really fight for them. And especially when they write for them and stuff like that. I just love that. I think it adds a lot to the performance and it makes me more interested in the project once it comes out. So I really didn't care, (laughs) to, to be honest, about the Lando series before I heard this. I thought it had been scrapped, actually, but now it seems like it definitely is on. And once the writer strike is over, we will hear news about a series coming from Disney Plus dealing with Lando Calrissian. He definitely is an interesting character. He's a scoundrel. We don't know a lot about him, so there's a lot they could do with the character. And Donald Glover is a phenomenal actor. He can do humor. He can do drama. He can do action. He can do it all. And he can even sing. So I would, I'd love to see him on screen again as Lando. But let me know in the comments, are you a fan of his take on the character? Are you just not a fan of Star Wars at all and don't care anything about it? Or are you excited to see him on screen again as Lando Calrissian? Let me know in the comments below. So now let's talk about something else that happened in the real world. And those are the UFO hearings that occurred with the House subcommittee last week. Now, I'm not going to go over everything because there was a lot that happened. But there was a good article from NBC about five takeaways from the House subcommittee hearings on unidentified aerial phenomenon, which UAPs is the new UFO, apparently. And so I thought I'd go over those in case you were wondering, you know, what happened with those UFO hearings? Did they prove that there are UFOs? Was it crap? Are they they full of it? You know, what's going on? And I'll tell you my opinion as well. So the first takeaway is that the government is absolutely in possession of UAPs. David Grush, a former U.S. intelligence official, told the panel that he is absolutely certain that the federal government is in possession of UAPs, citing interviews he said he conducted with 40 witnesses over a four-year period. So this starts the problem for me. So I watched this quite a bit, and this guy, David Grush, he just seems shady to me. Like, he never answers a question fully. They, a lot of different people from both sides of the, the aisle, Republicans and Democrats, asked him very specific questions, and he was super cagey, like, oh, I can give you a list of people, or I shared that information with the appropriate people who can talk to the appropriate people. But he would never like come out and say, yes, here's a picture or here's proof that this happened. He is just like the middleman between all this stuff. And I saw on another podcast that he's also claimed to know a lot of other crazy stuff. So I don't see him as the most credible witness. There's a lot of like, okay, we'll follow up on this and we'll follow up on that. I don't know where that's going to lead. Maybe that's a little more important than this hearing. Because besides this guy, they talked to other guys too, but this guy in particular was very cagey and very like, I already shared that information. I can't say that in this venue, like kind of stuff. And it it was so politicky that like, I was just, it was just turning my stomach. I, I really just wanted him to be like, look, this is what an alien looks like. This is where we found him. These were the circumstances and this is the proof. But that definitely did not happen. Again, if you watch these and saw something different, let me know in the comments. But from my perspective, I did not hear that. But he did say some other stuff. Uh, The second point that was made was that non-human biologics were found at a crash site. Grush, who underscored that he had not personally spotted a UAP, told the panel that he knows of multiple colleagues who were injured by UAPs. He also said he has interviewed individuals who have recovered non-human biologics from crashed UAPs. Again, not personally spotted, knows multiple colleagues interviewed individuals, doesn't know a damn thing. Like he has never been there, it seems, like when any of this stuff happened. So it's really hard to believe this guy. And I want to believe, like I'm definitely the David Duchovny in the audience. Like I am somebody who definitely believes that there are aliens. I think it would be impossible that there are no aliens out there. So I want these guys to be right. I want to hear the proof. And they're making me skeptic which is not good because, you know, it's like preaching to the converted. I want this to be true, but I really don't hear it from what they're saying in this hearing. Another takeaway was that officials must establish a safe and transparent reporting process. Some lawmakers and witnesses pushed the federal government to establish clear channels to communicate UAP information with both the public and military and said the military should establish a comprehensive reporting process for unidentified object sightings. 
This is, of course, because in the past five years or so, it has become very evident that this stuff is out there, that people are getting this on their cameras and stuff like that. Before, it was those grainy, you know, Bigfoot cameras, but now everybody's got a state-of-the-art camera on their phone. And also, it seems like people that have served are sharing their information with people. And we're going to actually talk about that in a second. But you could see during the hearings that the people that are asking the questions were also getting very flustered and very agitated by the answers they were given from these people because there was no X marks the spot. There was no, this happened and this is how it happened. It's all, you can follow up here or I know this person did this. And it was really hard to listen to because you just want somebody to say, yes, this happened or no, this didn't happen. And you definitely did not hear this in the hearing. Another takeaway was that the stigma associated with sightings silences possible witnesses. Some witnesses and lawmakers at the hearing argued that the stigma associated with reported UFO sightings, as well as the alleged harassment of those who work to investigate them, may be hindering efforts to determine their origins. This was another reason given for why they can't give definitive information about what they found to the public. I don't know if this was another cop-out or if this was another way to say this is really happening, but I don't want to get killed for saying this on TV. I don't know, but it was very hard to believe these people because they're so cagey and they're so talking out of the side of their mouth that you don't know, you know, if it's true or not. And then the final kind of thing that uh, was kind of brought out during the hearings was that they have proof of UFOs spotted accelerating to supersonic speeds. A former Navy commander said he and three pilots spotted a white tic-tac-shaped object in 2004 hovering below their jets and just above the Pacific Ocean that accelerated from a standing position to supersonic speed and descended to inspect the sighting, claimed the unidentified aircraft, which he said bore no visible rotors, wings, or exhaust, began to ascend and approach his fighter jet. He claimed that the UAP then vanished, only to reappear a few seconds later, but this time it was spotted 60 miles away. He told the committee that the technology he and his team encountered defies logical explanation and was quoted as saying, the technology that we face is far superior to anything that we had, and there's nothing we can do about it. Nothing. So this guy seemed to have been scared about whatever he saw, and he had, I guess, a video of what he saw, but again, they can't prove what it was. And it happened in 2004. So almost 20 years ago. Is this proof? I don't know. And that's the most frustrating thing that it seemed like we were going to get the answer from this hearing. And I don't know that we did. But let me know. Did you watch the hearings? Did you see anything about them? What do you think about this story? Do you think it proves that there are UFOs out there? I think my feeling about it is that no, I don't think this hearing does prove that. But I still believe that there are UFOs out there. I just think it wasn't proven yet. But I think that, no, there are UFOs out there and that we are not alone. But let me know, what did you think of this hearing? And do you think this proves that there are UFOs and that we have made contact with them? So now finally, I thought I would take a look at the series Secret Invasion and also a look at the other series in the MCU catalog. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because I know I hyped up Secret Invasion a little bit. And I'm really sorry that I did because... It was not good. I really thought that they could have done a lot more with it. And it just seemed like a very generic MCU series. And to that point, we know that uh, at the time of recording this podcast, Secret Invasion is not only the worst reviewed MCU series to date, but Disney and the MCU have now released the worst reviewed series and film, that film being Quantumania, in the same year, this year, 2023. So not great for the MCU. A lot of people are saying that there is some fatigue with the MCU. I think the uh, head of the MCU or maybe even uh, one of the heads of Disney came out and said that the MCU series were a mistake and they shouldn't have done them at all. I don't think that. Uh, and I think that for the most part, they were okay. I think all in all, there were nine series and two specials. And I'm going to talk about the nine series. But for instance, the two specials, I think, were hits. They had a Halloween special based on Werewolf by Night, which was done in black and white and was really cool and had the man thing in it. I loved it. I thought it was really great. It had horror. It had, uh, you know, really great style. It had humor. And then we had the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special, which I thought was phenomenal. I thought it was a lot of fun. I actually thought it was a lot more fun than the last Guardians movie. And probably a lot of people agree with me, I'm guessing. But as far as the specials go, I think they knocked those out of the park. And it was interesting because 
One of them had a lot to do with the MCU, which was the Guardians of the Galaxy special. It kind of set up some things that happened in the movie that came out after. But the Werewolf by Night special had nothing really to do with the rest of the MCU. I mean, it had some mention, but really didn't have much to do with the rest of the, you know, overarching plot line. And I thought that that really helped it. And I think that if they want to do successful series in the future, they may want to look at the specials a little bit more than the series on how to make them successful. So, like I said, there are nine MCU series, and I'm going to go through each one from the one I like the least to the one I like the most. So the one I'm going to start with is the What If cartoon, and I definitely like that the least out of any of the MCU series. And no, it's not because it was done in animation. I'm a fan of animation when it's done right. I'm a fan of Star Trek Lower Decks, and that's animation. But I will say that I didn't like the animation style for this series. I don't know what it was. I know one common flaw that has been voiced the MCU is that their use of CGI and animation has not been great because they rush people sometimes and we get a lot of unfinished products and sometimes they change stuff after the fact, like after it's already released, they'll go back and change something. And and I think that happened with uh, this series in particular, but I just didn't like it. I didn't like the animation. I didn't like the stories. And the thing that ticks me off the most, and, and this will also be common in the next series I discussed, is that I love the What If comic books. I thought that those were the most fun and they just showed, you know, a different take on characters and I love them. They were some of my favorites. I collected them and it really like bummed me out that this series was so bad and and that it connected to the greater MCU because if they followed the comic book series, the comic book series was like an Elseworlds and at times it did have connections to what would become the canon uh, comic book, you know, storyline. But for the most part, these were like other worlds comic book stories that didn't have anything to do with the characters they were based on. And I think that they would have been smarter in the MCU to do the series animated style like this. I think that they would have not tried to connect to the MCU like they did and make up this Guardians of the Multiverse, whatever. they. I don't even know what they ended on because it was so convoluted. I think it would have turned out better. And that's really why I didn't like What If. And it's a prime example of the MCU not using the comic book title the series is based on to its full potential. Because I think that What If is one of the best things that Marvel Comics has ever done. But I'm now saying it's the worst series that the MCU has ever done. Speaking of a time when the MCU did not use the title correctly, my next least favorite series, and I guess the one that I like a little bit more than What If, is Secret Invasion, the one that just came out. I pretty much think what most people have said, you know, I think that this was just kind of a silly series. I didn't really like any of the performances. I think that the ending really did not make a lot of sense. The only guy I really liked was Gravik, the guy who played like the main bad guy. I thought he did a really good job. You know, the fact that they made certain characters in the MCU imposters, they could have made that way more interesting and they could have made those characters more interesting. I think they just really dropped the ball. Again, this was another story I really loved in the comics, and they just, they really did not use it well for this series. In the comic books, it just changes the scope of like every comic, basically, that it touches. And this series, it didn't feel like that. Like, even though at the end, it starts basically a war against everybody that's not a human being, it didn't feel like it had the same gravitas as the comic book series did. And that was just a waste uh, for me. I just, I thought it was, you know, it was just really hard to watch. The only reason I think this is better than What If is because I think it was easier to watch than What If because I didn't have the bad animation style, but I didn't like the story, I didn't like the characters, and I really did not like the series. So the next series that I liked a little bit better than Secret Invasion was Hawkeye. This story was okay. I mean, the, it was kind of fun. It wasn't really a superhero story as much as it was this, you know, kind of almost like karate kid style story where you have this person that the younger person looks up to and he's trying to train her and she's trying to train him to be a better person. And you have this family aspect to it. And all that was kind of nice. But I thought the appearance of the Kingpin was distracting and confusing because it wasn't really explained how this is a different Kingpin than we saw in the Netflix series. But it's played by the same actor. So it's kind of hard to disassociate that it's a different character. They also had an actor that I really like in the series that whose character sucked. And that was Tony Dalton. Uh, You may have known him from the series Better Call Saul. He was Lalo Salamanca, and he played a character that was supposed to be like the boyfriend of, I guess, one of the villains in this series, and they just wasted him. His character was really stupid, 
and I was sad that he was even in this series. So again, not a series that I really like too much. I thought the performances were better, though, than the uh, series Secret Invasion, and I thought it was a funner story than Secret Invasion. But again, I don't really care about the characters that much. I thought that while Haley Seinfeld did a, a fine job as Kate Bishop, she's probably going to show up in other things, and I'm probably going to like those things more than I did Hawkeye. So if this is her origin story, oh well, but it's something that I never really want to watch again. The next series that I liked a little bit more than Hawkeye was She-Hulk, and this is probably going to uh, surprise a couple people because She-Hulk is at the bottom of a lot of people's lists, and, and I agree with what most people say, that the CGI is really bad, and it's hard to watch sometimes. You want to just try and like work through it, but there's a lot of Uncanny Valley stuff, and I don't know if it's because they rush people and the series wasn't finished when it was released, because this is another series that was changed after it was first released to cover up what was considered like faulty CGI. I did think, though, that the performance of Tatiana Maslali was pretty good, but I liked her as Jennifer Walters a lot more than She-Hulk. Like, I thought she was really cute and really good as the character Jennifer Walters and her breaking the fourth wall. It was very Deadpool and stuff like that. I really liked those scenes, and I liked the cast. I liked the connections between the characters. I liked how some of them were quirky and stuff. But really, it was the superhero stuff in this story that I didn't like. The legal drama, Ally McBeal stuff, I liked. I thought really worked. And I thought, you know, the main star of the series did a really good job. But whenever the superhero stuff came along, I just thought it made it really messy and silly. And again, the CGI came out and the ending made no sense and was really crazy and out there. So the performances for me really saved this series. I thought that she did a great job as Jennifer Walters and some of the characters that kind of were connected to her, I thought did a great job. But for the most part, the story was bad and the CGI was horrible and the ending made no sense. So that's why it's, you know, kind of still low on my list. The next series that I liked uh, a little bit better than She-Hulk was The Falcon and the Winter Soldier. This had good performances by the stars Anthony Mackie and Sebastian Stan. And the story felt real and gritty. It was a nice change of tone from what we usually see in the MCU. And the series also gave us that great dance scene with uh, Daniel Bruhl as Baron Zemo in the uh, dance club. I thought that was hilarious. And probably one of the hardest times I've laughed in uh, anything created by the MCU. But I didn't think the performances were as good necessarily as She-Hulk. But I did think the story was better. It was easier to follow. Although much like She-Hulk, I didn't really like the ending. I thought the superhero stuff in this story for the first and second act were really good. I thought that, you know, taking it back to the struggles of African-American people, how Sam Wilson becoming Captain America would be felt by all communities. I thought that was really smart and really, you know, a story that needed to be told. So I really liked that part of the series. But Sam Wilson becoming Captain America at the end kind of felt forced and a little bit unearned to me because it really seemed like he was going to turn down the mantle. And maybe that even made more sense for him to kind of become like a new character and him becoming the next Captain America didn't make as much sense. But that withstanding, I thought the rest of the series was really good. I thought, you know, having that first Captain America go crazy and and showing, you know, how not everybody <laughs> it is meant to be a hero. I thought that was great. So there were a lot of good things in this series. Really, it was just the third act that I think fell flat for me. So for the most part, I would say I actually like this series. This is probably the first one that I would say overall I liked. And The Falcon and the Winter Soldier is probably a series that I'll watch again at some point and would recommend to somebody else. But I do think they could have created a better ending that felt a little bit more earned uh, than what we got. Then the series that I liked more than this series was Miss Marvel. Again, this may be a surprise to some people because not as many people like Miss Marvel as I think I did. But for me, it was the cast. I loved the cast of this series. Amon Vellani as the main character, I think she did a phenomenal job. Her family is amazing. I love the dynamic that they set up. I don't know a lot about this culture. After watching this series, I felt I learned a lot about her culture and the struggles that they have to go through. I thought that that was great. And I think that using a series like this as a vehicle to tell that story is phenomenal. It's very important. And it's exactly what this medium should be used for. And more so about the story, I thought it was like a fun Peter Parker style origin story. And I loved it. You know, I was a big fan of Spider-Man. That was probably the first 
superhero that I really latched onto when I was a kid. And the fact that this character was still a kid and, you know, having to deal with powers and stuff. I thought that that was really compelling. I thought it was great. And I thought she did a great job with the character. However, I did think the villain felt a little generic. And much like some of the other series that I didn't like, I thought the superhero side of the story fell flat. I think that, you know, when they're running around and shooting bolts of color at each other and stuff like that, it's not the best part of the series. I think that the best part of Miss Marvel is when you deal into the struggles of her family, you know, them coming over to this country. That was great to learn about. And that kind of aspect just made this series really special. And then when you just are just, you know, firing things, you know, when you just have people floating and shooting, you know, balls of light at each other, it makes it a little more generic. So outside of that, I thought it was just great and definitely a series I like, a series I would recommend, and a series I'll probably ask uh, my kids to watch one day. And now the next series that I'll say that I liked more than Miss Marvel is WandaVision. This one, again, had great performances by the lead cast, Elizabeth Olsen and Paul Bettany. And then you also have Katherine Hahn and Kat Dennings as very fun characters that really added a lot to the overall story. I liked how the beginning was like super weird. And then we got more into like a normal series and what have you. I thought it was a really intriguing plot line that felt more like a Twilight Zone episode than anything that you would see in like a comic book a movie or series. I liked the horror aspect to it. I thought that some of the member berries were okay and some of them were kind of not needed, especially towards the end. I think that, you know, when they introduced like the Ralph Boner character, I think that, that was kind of silly. And again, when they have to tie into the greater MCU, I think that a lot of these series just like fall apart. And that's what I, when I think WandaVision fell apart is that, of course, Elizabeth Olsen appeared as a character in a film following WandaVision, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. So they had to prepare her character for her appearance in that film. And when they had to do that, I think was probably the worst part of the series. And again, this was another one where I think the ending made little to no sense. Because in the end, you just have two women flying in the sky and shooting laser beams at each other. And even after that, Wanda did not get in any trouble for torturing a town full of people, which even at the time, like right when I watched it, I was like, what are you talking about? Like, how can you not prosecute or like or like get this person, you know, to, to somehow atone for her crimes? Because we know that she tortured all these people for who knows how long. And it's just like, oh, I learned my lesson. I'm going to fly away now because I'm sad. Like, it sucks that you lost your, you know, your boyfriend, but you still don't get to torture all these people. That's why if somebody, you know, harms somebody you love, you don't get to just go out and kill them. And they're like, oh, well, because this person killed somebody you love. Well, you get off scot-free. We don't care that you killed that person. No, you go to jail just as much as the person who did the first killing would. And the fact that she didn't have to, you know, face that justice. And it was just because she had to fly into the next movie, I think kind of, you know, ruined the ending for me. But for the most part, I thought it was a great series and it really pushed the boundaries of what an MCU series could be. And that's what I really liked about it. Speaking of which, I think Loki is the next series that I like and probably the series that I like the second most out of any series that the MCU has released. Much like I said for, you know, what I've liked about most of these series, fantastic performances by the entire cast. Great chemistry between everyone, you know, Tom Hiddleston, Owen Wilson, and then even Sofia DiMartino as Sylvie. I thought that there were some great characters and even their co-stars, I thought really did a great job. The casting was really perfect in this series. And I even thought the villain was good. Now, remember, Jonathan Majors is not literally playing the same character he did in Quantumania. He was playing a different character named He Who Remains. And I thought he did a really good job as that character. He was really weird and out there and he looked crazy. Like I bought that this guy was out of his mind and it seemed like he was really scary in a different way, scary, like almost like the Joker, but maybe more omnipotent. So kind of even more crazy, but I really liked that. And I liked the ending. I thought that uh, the ending did make sense for once, even though it was pretty complicated. I, I think that it was easy to discern what was going on in the series. You know, this series was a re was to act as a reboot for the MCU. And I think that came across. And even though this was a mostly fun series, it did have a very dark undertone. I like the ability that the series Loki had to change the tone from, you know, very dark to very light, back down to dark, back down to light, because that's what the character is. Loki is a very ambiguous character. 
and the series represented that. So that would mean that my favorite series that the MCU has produced is Moon Knight. Again, this is probably not everybody's favorite series that the MCU has created, but without a doubt, it is mine because I love the concept of everything in the series from the locations where it took place to the hero to the villain. I mean, basically everything about this series I really like. We had amazing performances by Oscar Isaac playing multiple characters, I think at least three. And then we also had Ethan Hawke as this really shady villain with this like kind of religious background that some is somewhat more scary. And, you know, the fact that people follow him and stuff like that. It was a compelling story about loss and mental illness. And along the way, we had this Indiana Jones style quest line. I just loved it. It was just perfect for me. It was exactly what I would want to tune into for an MCU series. And the fact that it didn't really have to connect to anything else in the MCU really benefited. I think the only part of this series that connects, I think something has to do with Miss Marvel in this series. I'm not sure what, but it really makes no difference because the series didn't have a lot to do with what was going on in the MCU. And I love that. I love that it didn't have those crutches and it didn't have to be, you know, this or that. It could be whatever it wanted to be. And it was great. I think Oscar Isaac played a vulnerable character, he played a powerful character, he played a smart character, and he was able to take the back seat when he needed to. And Ethan Hawke was just a great villain, and I love the back and forth between those characters in the series. So, without a doubt, Moon Knight is my favorite MCU series. And just to wrap things up, in case you're counting at home, this is how I would rank the series from worst to first. The worst is What If, then Secret Invasion, then Hawkeye, then She-Hulk, then The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, then Miss Marvel, then WandaVision, then Loki, and then number one would be Moon Knight. So if you haven't seen any, I would say definitely watch Moon Knight, Loki, and WandaVision. If you like those, give Miss Marvel and the Falcon and the Winter Soldier a try. And I think that you'll like those series because I think those, I would say, are definitely good. I think She-Hulk is good at times, Hawkeye is good at times, and Secret Invasion and What If are just crap. Like Just, just don't even waste your time. I, I wouldn't watch those at all. But let me know, what do you think of my rankings? Do you agree with them? Do you not care about the MCU at all? Do you watch the MCU? And if you do watch the MCU, what do you think is the best series? I would love to know your rankings in the comments below. Well, that is all I have for this week, but let me know in the comments if I missed anything. Just a reminder that I am back to releasing episode-specific Easter egg videos during the week, so be sure to check those out as well, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time on What Did I Miss?